And so, on with the last topic for this lecture, which is about the presentation of results and some principles and some considerations about when the presentation that we make might actually mislead the reader. Of course, not intentionally, but it does happen. The first uh, couple of points I want to make are some potential problems, and these are based on either actual examples or models on examples that we've all seen. The first one is the idea of exaggeration. So on this graph, we present the uh, average change in depression scores on the horizontal axis and the two groups being compared, which we looked at earlier. This is the active CBT trial versus the uh, placebo arm. And what it looks like is that there is a substantial difference between the CBT results, which are much more negative, indicating a greater improvement than in the placebo arm, which are comparatively close to zero. And what the, the researcher has done here is to present the re results in a way which zoom in on the data. So one argument is that this graph makes efficient use of the graph space available. The downside to that approach is that it appears to exaggerate the apparent difference between these two mean reductions in Hamilton score, because if we look at the actual numbers, the difference in the scores in reductions in absolute terms is minus 1.3, but the standard deviation is 11.2, giving us a Cohen's D of 0 0.12, which is well down into the small effect size range. Even though visually, it looks like there is a clear and substantial difference between these two groups. This is a fairly well-known phenomenon. Here's another example from a media outlet outlet where it looks like there's been a, a fairly dramatic and consistent increase in the number of individuals in the US who are receiving some sort of welfare payment. What it hides is the fact that the axis, the graph rather, starts on the vertical axis at 94 million and rises to 106 million, but that's over a period of several years. So again, the apparent magnitude of the increase of number of people receiving welfare payments is v exaggerated by the uh, structure of this graph. So zooming in uh, has uh, some logic to it, um, but it certainly has a very strong uh, counter logic in terms of um, potentially misleading or exaggerating the appearance of the graph. And in general, it's better to start your graphs at uh, zero on the y-axis and then go up as far as the data um, actually goes. In here, this is just a counterexample um, uh, as to when it might be useful to do some zooming in. In this example, um, we're looking at um, a blood pressure measurement on the vertical axis and frequency of uh, consumption of hard liquor, meaning spirits uh, generally, on the horizontal axis. So we're interested in whether increasing frequency of hard liquor consumption is associated with an increase in blood pressure. And the problem here is that most of the data are concentrated between zero and let's say 50. You've got a smaller number up to around 150, and you've got three points here which are at about 300 and above. And so most of, most of our graph space is being used up by these three data points. The vast majority of our data is below 150 or even below 50 actually. So this graph is quite difficult to interpret. It's not misleading per se, but it is quite difficult to interpret because most of the data are squashed down into quite a small space here over on the left. One way of getting around this, which does not um, create the uh, exaggeration problem of the previous graph, is to change the way the scale is scaled. So in this case, I've used a logarithmic scale where the um, dot points in indicate an order of magnitude. So this is 0 0.01, 0.1, 1, 10, 100, and so on. What it does is to stretch out the data points to use most of the graph space available. 
at least on this horizontal axis. And it gives us a clearer picture um, of the, the pattern of points without creating that exaggeration which we saw in the very first graph. So that's the key trade-off to make here, is to use the space efficiently. That principle is quite sound, but in a way which does not cause any form of distortion or biased interpretation of the graph. I also wanted to talk about more complex graph. What you've learnt about in PSYC 105, and we'll spend um, a lot of the PSY 248 time talking about, are what we call bivariate relationships. So one independent variable and one dependent variable. In psychology, however, uh, particularly in some areas like uh, social psychology, we're interested in relationships between more than two variables simultaneously. So it might be uh, across domains such as demographics, personality, mood, um, cognitive processes, and some outcomes such as quality of life and things of that nature. So sometimes we're, we are, as researchers in psychology, trying to understand relationships amongst a number of variables in a complex system. And displaying those complex relationships with the sort of graphs we're looking at in 105 is quite challenging. So I wanted to show you this one graph just as an example to cast forward to the probably distant future um, about how we can go about uh, displaying more complex data. And I also do it as a, um, a point of light relief in that uh, this graph is, well, it's a bit funny actually. So this graphical format is called a Chernoff face. And what Chernoff faces do is allow us to represent the individual data points with as many dimensions as we need, almost. So in this graph, each face is an individual. So clearly Chernoff faces only work for comparatively modest sample sizes. And the idea is that uh, every aspect of the face can represent a different variable. So the eyebrows, for example, up here, their length and their angle can represent two variables. The eyes, their size, whether they are horizontal or angled, can be another variable or two. The nose, likewise. So this person here has quite a short nose. This one has quite a long nose. Likewise, the face, the ears and their shapes can all represent different variables. So this is a multivariate graph and it allows us to represent a number of variables simultaneously. I do stress I put, up, put this up here as a point of light relief largely in that um, they're also quite difficult to interpret. Um, but there are some other formats which we will look at um, in later years which allow us to represent maybe three or four variables simultaneously but in a more practical way than Chernoff faces. In the meantime, enjoy the faces. Now, in contrast, I would like to show you one of my favourite graphs. This comes from a book uh, by a guy called Tufter, and it illustrates uh, Napoleon's march on Moscow um, between 1812 and 1813. And I like it because it displays quite rich information in a very accessible format. And by rich information, I mean a number of variables. So what it displays is uh, time. So the gray shaded area here uh, is from left to right is Napoleon's march on Moscow from France. The width of the um, bar here is the size of his army at that time. And you can see that it diminishes quite substantially as he goes towards Moscow. And then this dark segment here is his return from Moscow back to France. So it's quite small when he gets back. Um, when he gets right back here to France, you can see that the width of this dark black line compared to the width of the outgoing line is minuscule. So clearly the campaign was a disaster from the human perspective. So we have uh, time being displayed. We have direction of march being displayed. We have size of the army being displayed. We also, in a sense, have XY coordinates in terms of geography because this is France down here, Russia over here. This is roughly a sort of north-south axis. 
and we also have temperature being displayed. So this is on the way back, um, the temperature when they left Moscow, the temperature as they got back towards France. We also have uh, some information about uh, replenishments and directional changes of the army. So I like this graph because it's relatively uncluttered. It displays a number of variables simultaneously about this important, if ill-fated, campaign. And it was created a long time ago. So I think that this is uh, a nice example of a slightly left field thinking uh, way of displaying data in a way which will resonate with people who are not necessarily experts on this topic. And I think that principle is something to think about when you're creating your own graphs. And again, in terms of out of the box thinking, I quite like this graph not because it's actually a graph, but because it visually illustrates a point being made in the text. So it's possible to have visual displays which in some way complement uh, numbers in tables or text on a page, which make what's being said more salient to the reader. In this case, it's about how fast people walk in the US versus uh, Prague and Greece. And just the person walking uh, makes the information a bit more resonant than just saying it in words and numbers. So again, it's worth thinking about what visual displays would assist the reader in understanding the data which you're presenting. And it's all about thinking about your readership and what will make sense to them rather than what you think is the most interesting and informative way of displaying that data.